with Stephanie Longquist, who's a co-founder of West Coast Wild Ones, uh, an organization that engages in education um, and uh, our natural world and possibilities. And we're very pleased that she can be here and present on Rethinking Your Lawn. Um, it's really wonderful to be here to get to talk to the Olmsted Society because we share, West Coast Wild Ones and um, the Olmsted Society share the desire to bring community together through how our, our landscapes um, connect and touch upon each other. So um, thank you for having me. I love being here. Um, so the title is Rethinking the Lawn, Native Plants. So what we're going to be doing is looking at native plants, what they are, what their benefits are, and um, what native plants you can use in your own landscapes to start to uh, reduce the size of your lawn, if that's where you want to go, or add in new beds, flower beds, and things like that. So um, there's a lot of uh, sometimes preconceptions about native plants, and we can talk about those as we go along. But um, hopefully, as you know, um, as you see, that there are so many benefits to including native plants into reducing the size of your lawn um, is probably where um, many people are headed anyway. Um, so just very briefly about Wild Ones, if you're not familiar uh, with the organization. So we are a local chapter um, of the National Wild Ones, which is a nonprofit environmental uh, advocacy um, organization. So we seek to educate the public about native plants, because a lot of our education about gardens and plants usually happens at the garden center, which may or may not be the best source of information. So we have um, monthly programs sort of like this, we have people come in and lecture about different things. We've had people come and talk about, um, you know, uh, sh the uh, mushrooms of the Chicago region. We've had Dr. Taren come and talk about butterflies of the American prairie. We've had landscapers come and talk about um, how to landscape with native plants. Uh, somebody come and talk about uh, invasive species. What are some alternatives? And um, somebody come and talk about. Um, landscaping for uh, migratory birds. We have lots of different uh, speakers coming on a variety of topics. Um, we try to participate as much as possible in community events. That's from the July 4th Oak Park Parade. We gave out hundreds of packets of seeds. We gave out about 100 um, bare root seedlings of milkweed and purple prairie clover and could have given out more. People are very hungry for this. Um, so it was a delight to be there. And we were trying to bring back the prairie to prairie style because Oak Park is known for prairie architecture. However, there's not much prairie. Um, so in Jens Jensen's, who was a famous um, early um, d uh, landscape architect who loved the American prairie, he loved American wildflowers, gave Frank Lloyd Wright a hard time because he didn't really have any prairie included with his prairie architecture, so he thought it was a real lack. Um, and we have yard tours, so here's a picture of um, Linda uh, Walker, who is a longtime DuPage Wild Ones member, and um, she's a double lot. She's been gardening with native plants for about 20 years, um, so she shared her yard with us. And we're going to have one coming up um, this fall as well, another yard tour. So people get to go to yards, they get to see the plants, um, they get to see how they look in you know, a home landscape and whether they'd want to use it or not. Um, so, and um, this was a very important event for us. That is Doug Tallamy. And if you haven't heard of him, he's somebody you really should hear. He's probably the most important person you haven't heard of. Um, he is a professor of ecology at the University of Maryland. And he wrote a famous book called Bringing Nature Home. And um, he's the thought leader for this na native garden natural landscaping movement. Um, he brings the science to lay people, to regular people who just want to do something about the um, state of environmental affairs, do something positive and good in their own yards. So he teaches us that in the U.S. we've developed about 95% of the land for human use. Um, and then studies have island, you know, studies where they study, um, studies where they've looked at what happens on islands um, when there's a loss of habitat on an island. Uh, there's a, a pretty strict correlation between loss of habitat and loss of species. There's an extinction. So, um, so if you have if you've lost lost 95 percent of um, your your land, um, or you've developed it for human uh, human use, you can expect to see a pretty significant extinction rate. And a lot of experts agree that we are in the sixth mass extinction right now, um, as far as other species are concerned, because we've made such a huge impact on the planet. So Doug Tallamy's message is that that's very grim. 
Um, however, it's very hopeful that we can change things um, in the United States. So when he wrote the book, there was about 40 million acres of lawn in the US, and that's probably closer to 50 million now, and it keeps growing. His idea is that even if we took half of our lawn space and we converted it to um, native gardens, shrubs and trees and plants, um, we would have the, mat, the, the size greater than all of our national parks put together. So he calls it the, the, um, the homegrown national park. So thinking about our yards as sanctuaries, as nature preserves themselves. So he's very important. So if you can, really encourage you to read his book. He wrote a new book uh, with Rick Dark um, called Living Landscapes. Um, and uh, Rick Dark is a famous landscape architect, so combining this need for um, kind of a, you know, um, a formal aesthetic, people want their yards to look nice, um, and there is sort of this preconception that it's hard to do with native plants, but Rick Dark brings, um, you know, he, uh, he, he breaks it down into how to use the plants, how to create layers are very important. Um, so that's another really good book to take a look at. So he's, um, he's, a, a, um, he's a board member of the National Wild Ones too, Doug Tallamy. Um, the other thing we do, we started to put in um, some native gardens in um, places around, mostly Oak Park and, and River Forest. And this is just a little pocket prayer we put in at the Oak Park Main Library. And we worked with uh, some teen volunteers called the Green Thumbs one summer. And um, even though it's very small, it really illustrated the point that small is still powerful because that summer um, I got a, a note that a monarch had found its way to the library and actually had gone into the library. So imagine a monarch flying around here. And the reason she did that was because she had scented the milkweed that was in that small plot. So there's milkweed there. Um, and if you know the area, it's pretty much surrounded by concrete. There's no other place for milkweed. And monarchs have about 1,600 olfactory sensors on their bodies. So they can detect the, vol the volatile compounds of the milkweed. So there's this whole invisible universe that we have no idea about. But she found the milkweed. Um, they were able to safely, well, she found the area of the milkweed, so they were able to get her out of the library. Um, a little while later, I went back, and I found a, an empty chrysalis um, in some sedge in there. So I knew that you know, the, mo the milkweed had done its job, and there was, you know, the monarch was able to reproduce. And that was particularly hopeful, because that was the same year after the population crash. I don't know if you know anything about the monarch population, but about 2013, their population dropped to about 90% of its historical average since they've been tracking the, mo the monarch population. So it was nice to know that even a small space could do something for that population. And then the, the numbers are starting to rebound. Um, however, there was a pretty uh, significant um, winter um, storm in Mexico, uh, I think it was at some point in March, just before their migration. Um, and so Dr. Lincoln Brower, who studies them, was expecting about a 50% mortality. So it just goes to show that for these animals, we have to have a huge population because things can go wrong very quickly for them. So if there's a, you know, a, a snowstorm in Mexico, then there's a drought in Texas, their first stop along the way. And then if you know, there's storms, you know, for the storms, there's more loss of milkweed along their, their, their flight uh, path, um, they um, can get in trouble very quickly. So there's a lot of efforts being done for the monarch. So this is just a garden. It's got um, a variety of uh, purple coneflowers, some uh, goldenrod, and some anise hyssop. So a bunch of different plants um, planted in clusters so the pollinators can find them pretty easily, um, and a variety of host plants, too. So we had some other plants in there as well that would um, take care of other uh, butterfly caterpillars. Um, so I've talked about native plants, so very quickly, I'm going to just give that a definition. So a lot of people think they've evolved in a particular specific place, and people often will say uh, it's before Europeans settled here in North America. And then pe some people will quibble with that because they will say, well, Native Americans were moving plants. And that might be true, but not to the extent that we are. Um, we are moving things across continents. Um, you know, these, these plants have not ha had any kind of evolutionary connection for millions of years, and they're being jammed together. Um, so we like the definition that Doug Tallamy uh, comes up with. So and that's about, does it have ecological relationships? Are there relationships in the quote-unquote wild? Do other animals depend on this plant? Does this plant depend on other organisms in its environment? And if that's a yes, well, then it's, it's native. It's, it's been in the place long enough to have developed these interactions because it takes time um, for insects to be able to overcome a plant's defenses. They have to evolve to be able to sequester compounds and to be able to filter them out. Um, 
And then we also avoid uh, the use of nativars or cultivars. Um, and that's a little bit of a tricky, complicated topic. Um, some people think uh, if people can use nativars, that's a good step towards using natives. Um, but there's lots of cautions um, with that. So, because if you start to change what a plant looks like, you might be altering how it functions um, and interacts with other animals. So let's say you get a plant and you change the color of its leaves, you are therefore changing the chemistry composition of the leaves and then that would impact how the, um, if a, a caterpillar would be able to eat it. And the key to all of this, I'm probably jumping a little bit, is that Native plants feed herbivorous insects, which is really important, which then feed you know, birds and so on, going up the food web. So we want to make sure these plants can feed caterpillars and other insects. And just as a little side note, before we get upset about insects, 96 to 97% of insects are beneficial. So it's just a few that give insects a bad name. So we really want to have them around. Plus, the birds and the beneficial insects, they will all keep each other in check. So um, I just want to make that note because people get, oh, insects, terrible. Um, it's really not. They're fascinating. So, um, but cultivars, so we say to use them judiciously, um, you know, because if you, if you get a, a double flowered plant, um, there may not be nectar availability. Um, bees and butterflies uh, see in the UV, the UV spectrum, um, and a lot of these plants, the native ones, would have UV guides that we can't see, but the bees and the butterflies can, so they know exactly where to go to get the nectar. nectar. That might be removed if it's been bred and cultivated too much. So once you start tinkering with the plant, it's hard for us to know exactly what we're doing and how it's going to impact pollinators and butterflies and moths and things like that. And in general, native plants don't become invasive. Yes, they can become aggressive and form a monoculture, but there's often checks and balances. Um, there's you know, parasitic uh, plants that may take away the vigor of uh, you know, a very strong colony of sunflowers. Uh, there may be an outbreak of a certain moth or something, that somehow it's going to keep it in check. Invasive plants don't have those checks on them. There's nothing that can really eat them, um, and that's why they can spread unchecked uh, through our ecosystems. Any questions about native plants or anything? Okay. And feel free at any moment to stop me if I start talking too fast. Or I've... Would you also include the cultivars and the tree species on that definition? Sure, absolutely. Um, I know, you know, like elm and things like that. So I think Doug Talamy has found that the elm the, some of the caterpillars may still be able to eat, um, but there is like some shrubs, like uh, it's like the nine bark. That's the Diablo. It has the dark leaves, which may you know caterpillars may not be able to eat it because there's a certain uh, chemical compound that makes the purple leaves and um, makes it difficult for the caterpillars. But yeah, so we would also include you know trees and things like that. It's just better for us to go with straight natives, and it eliminates any confusion or lack of research um, about the ecological effectiveness of the plant, if that's what your goal is. To follow up on that, you would include the accolade elm that was created by Morton Arboretum? Do you, uh, as a cultivar, the accolade what's it, what's it been bred with? Uh, or how's it? Their creation proprietor. I, I can't answer because I don't know exactly what they, if they bred it, they cloned it, I don't know what, how they created it, so it's a good question. Um, and another thing that uh, we're, Wild Ones is trying to do with uh, native plants is to create a wildlife corridor. And so usually we hear about corridors with big, large mammalian species, you know, really connecting large segments and land bridges and things like that. We're thinking about it more as a stepping stone, and the reason why is it's just so important um, because of this. You can see it just goes, I'm up in a plane here. Um, and you can just see the rectangular shapes just going as far as the eye can see. And it was pretty much that way my whole trip. Um, and I didn't quite believe Doug Talmy when I had read that you know, statistic about 95% to 97% of the land had been developed. And then I looked out the window and I was, oh, it's true. It really is true. I thought we had these magical areas where everything existed pure and, you know, and was able to fulfill its, uh, you know, um, its, its life the way it was meant to. Um, so the problem is that when you have these, you have these little pieces of habitat, these little islands, um, it's fragmented. The animals can't move. And so with Oak Park and the Chicago area, we're focusing on animals that fly because of the infrastructure of roads and things like that. Um, so we try to create more and more. So if all these areas had more you know, trees and shrubs along the, the lines, the buffer lines, uh, it would be better habitat, it would be better for these animals. Um, and uh, the other problem, too, with these fragmented islands or habitats is that um, 
the, they're so degraded. They're under assault all the time from invasive species. So anybody who's involved with any kind of restoration knows that you might restore a spot, but it's never done because there's always something new coming in or the seeds from buckthorn are still there and you have to keep battling it. So it's not like any nature of the wild areas are pristine anymore. Um, so there's fragmentation and degradation. Um, and so it isolates the animals from each other. So the more uh, resources they have, their host plants, uh, the more healthy their populations will be and they'll be able to um, d contribute to the ecosystems um, that they offer us. Uh, and I mentioned the monarch here. So the monarch is a good story because it shows us what happens if we take away their habitat. So one of the um, reasons for the, the crash was the loss of habitat in the corn in the corn belt. So because of the use of Roundup and you know, Roundup resistant corn um, and soybean. So it, they, farmers spray, and I don't blame them, you know, they want to increase profits and things like that. And then it, it removes any of those edges, those kind of the weedy edges um, that um, might have supported you know, other animals like it used to. Um, but work is being done, farmers are partnering now with organizations like the Monarch Joint Venture. Um, and so things are changing. So it was, it's really good and it does show that when people come together, um, you know, they can really affect change. And the, po and the population did, start, did go up, but we still have to get it back up to where it was if it's gonna weather any kind of other, you know, like weather, pests, diseases, parasites. Um, and this is a Wilson's warbler. Um, birds are in, um, in general, birds are in trouble too, and a lot of people love birds. I mean, the birding industry is worth millions of dollars. People spend a lot of money to go birding. Um, these guys are down about 60% um, of their, their uh, population since they started keeping track in the 60s. Um, and again, you know, loss of habitat. Um, cats, uh, window strikes are a huge uh, problem for them so that the more we keep our cats inside, we create bird friendly windows, we plant trees, we plant shrubs, things that provide um, you know, uh, good eating uh, for insects because that's what they eat as they're moving through. A lot of warblers are insectivores, they have to eat insects. So if we want these beautiful little creatures coming through, we have to have, their, um, we have, to have food plants to support their food. Um, and you've probably heard about pollinators are in distress as well. <laughs> and we'll, we'll, we'll move out of this in a second. So bumblebees are also um, struggling. And then as in my own yard, as I've moved towards more native plants and um, changing how I clean up my yard, I have been astounded at the diversity of, of bees, native bees. We have about 500 species, according to the Chicago Botanic Garden, of native bees. Um, they're all, most of them are solitary with the exception of bumblebees and carpenter bees. Um, many of them, I wanna say like 60% nest in the ground um, and they uh, form a tunnel and they might share an entrance hole with other females, but otherwise they're, they're solitary. They're creating little cells. They're uh, getting bee bride, which is a combination of pollen and nectar, and then laying an egg on it. Um, and a lot of the bees have specialist relationships with native plants. They have to have a certain type of pollen from a native plant. They're not gonna get it from a camellia or a daffodil. It has to be from either a sunflower or a goldenrod or something in the aster. If not, they won't, they can't, the larva can't survive. Um, and all of this is still, the native bees and how they're surviving and reproducing and how they're, what their exact numbers are are very much a burgeoning area of study. Um, scientists are discovering a lot about these guys. There's even one, there's in the, the polyester group and they, um, they're being studied uh, because when they, uh, they make their tunnel and their nesting cells, they line it with a kind of natural plastic that is um, it's basically immune to fungi and bacteria. And um, so scientists are studying that. Can, is this a kind of plastic we can use? Because it's pretty tough. It will last a couple of years, but it does eventually break down. So scientists are studying, like, what, is, what are they exactly using? And is this something that we can take and then therefore use it you know, in our own technologies? So it's pretty interesting. So this is um, in the Osmia genus. You can see she's got a little, she's got a little packet of pollen under there. They nest in stems um, and twigs. And this is in the Megachile, and she's got this little yellow abdomen. And then we have a little hoverfly there photobombing. Um, and they, uh, their larvae are um, really great predators of aphids. So and, um, the more you have you know, diversity of plants, you are easy in your cleanup, the more that you're gonna be able to support these insects that 
you know, do good things for you in, the, in, the, um, in your yard. So this bumblebee is on um, Monarda fistulosa, which is wild bee balm, which is a really great plant to have. I really recommend it. Um, it it's got a really nice uh, mint uh, smell to it, and it's a, just a beautiful plant. Hummingbirds like it. There's a red one, um, Monarda didyma, which is not exactly native to northern Illinois. It's more of a southern species, but hummingbirds love that one too. Um, and this one is on um, prairie sun drops, and I'll talk about that one a little bit later. Uh -huh. Uh, this first one, um, it's uh, wild bee balm, or um, Monar the, the Latin name, the scientific name is Monarda fistulosa. How tall is that one gets about three, four feet tall. Outstanding. Kind of like a nice, it gets like a nice uh, vase-like, um, you know, shape. It doesn't sound, it might spread slowly by rhizomes, but it's not excessively aggressive. It can get a little bit of powdery mildew. Can you plant um, like too many? Can you plant too many? <laughs> I don't think so. I mean, they like some moist, moist spot, hard I mean, sun. Can you them out, or I mean, it. You could. I mean, if you planted it, what do you mean crowd it out? Who do you? Who would crowd? Too it many out? in in too small of an area. Um, I think they would keep themselves in check. I mean, I would allow for probably about two or three feet on either side for one mature plant, and they will slowly spread. The Monarda uh, didyma spreads a little bit more aggressively. Um, these guys are a little more delicate, this one. So I love it. It's really nice. I, I'll have more after you're done. Okay, more great. Questions. And then this one, um, you don't get to see the whole plant, but it's, um, it's a, a good plant to have. It can uh, self-seed a little bit prolifically, and it's white snake root. And I think I have pictures of it somewhere else. Um, and that one's historically interesting because um, President Lincoln's mother died from drinking milk from a cow that had eaten too much white uh, snake root. So you don't want to have it in your pasture for your cows if they don't have any other forage. But um, otherwise, it's a really great plant. It flowers in the late fall. It will have all the pollinators over it. It will go in full sun, part sun, and shade. It just doesn't get as big or it flower as much, but it still does kind of light up a dark, shady area. Um, but you do, you know, you will be pulling up seedlings here and there. And it's got, the, sh the leaves are really nice too. Um, and I know that you guys have done some garlic mustard polling, so I won't spend too much time, but this is just a real good um, illustration of what an invasive plant does. So this is at the Trailside Museum out at near Thatcher Woods, and I participated in a garlic mustard polling session. So this is the before picture. It's just covered in garlic mustard, and they want to get it before it sets seed because just thousands of seeds explode and go everywhere and then just continues to colonize the area. So we pulled, and then we've got the nice, this is a beautiful shade plant um, called Virginia Watermark. There's some others in there. There's some trillium struggling to hang on. Um, but uh, so we were able to pull it, and then that way it gives these guys some sun because there's some openings. You know, they get the dappled sun, and you know, water, soil, things like that, um, so they can get a little bit stronger and then hopefully beat out the garlic mustard. And this is the one, one, one pile, and you can just see there's like way more. So it's just, it's really incredible. So garlic mustard is really awful for our woodlands. Um, buckthorn is also really bad, honeysuckle, um, multiflora rosa, and a lot of these are escapees from gardens. So if you plant native plants, you're avoiding making this kind of a situation where these just an invasive, you know, the plant escapes the garden and then makes its way through the ecosystems. And it just, it costs a lot of money and um, a lot of volunteer hours, a lot of work goes into trying to, you know, um, resuscitate the ecosystems out there. So this is our wildlife corridor map. This was a little while ago. So we are, you know, getting our pins. It's getting pretty well filled in. We have people out in Indiana. We have somebody up in Wisconsin. We have people farther afield in Illinois. So um, we're starting to join up with other organizations um, outside the Chicago area too uh, to think about more of a regional, a larger corridor, maybe even go f full Illinois. Um, so. A lot of people are interested in this idea of trying to visualize uh, the connection between how our yards work because the animals don't recognize fence boundaries, they don't recognize city boundaries, they don't recognize country boundaries, they don't recognize continent boundaries. The birds that come through my yard are coming from, right this time of the year, they're coming from South America and then they're making their way up to Canada. They don't, and they've been doing that forever, and they do it all by themselves. They don't have fast food restaurants, you know. <laughs> they don't have GPS. 
they're doing it all by themselves. Um, and so they, they're connecting, you know, these the, the different cultures and the people. So I just, I find it mind blowing when I think about, um, you know, what they do and how hard they have to work to be able to make those, um, make those roads. So the less lawn, the more native plants, um, the, the better off for everybody. Um, and now I've been talking about the benefits to, to wildlife. So once you start to reduce your lawn and you expand your gardens, or let's say you're not even a gardener, you just, you know, you plant native ground cover, you plant some shrubs, you plant some trees, you are doing an awful lot of good. It's really, it's almost even better than having like a prairie if you have lots of trees and shrubs and things like that, because those things can support if an oak tree can support about 500 different kinds of caterpillars, you know, milkweed supports three or four different kinds of insects. So, uh, you know, a lot of bang for your buck in your space if you're going with shrubs and trees. Um, but as far as we are concerned, a lot less cost. You're not paying somebody to mow your lawn, put down the applications, the pesticides, um, irrigation, you know, trimming it, you know, worrying about grubs and things like that. It's a lot less worry and concern and cost for you. Um, a lot less need for irrigation. I have a number a little bit later for that. Um, and again, like I said, you're not going to be paying people to do all that to that work that you have to have somebody come out on a weekly basis to take care of things. Um, I don't know about you, but out in Oak Park and River Forest, we're really worried about storm water. So these uh, native plants can help to um, mitigate storm water. And I'll show you pictures later about why that is. But it's mostly due to their, their, their deep roots. Um, they create channels into the soil, which helps the water to, to travel through. Um, and the other big thing is they sequester carbon dioxide quite a bit. And this is a tick tree foil. This is just a seedling. It's a few weeks old, and you can just see its root system now. It's, has just, uh, it's about you know, three times the size of the plant. Um, so, and, that's, you know, and that's just a few weeks old. So give that, give that about a year or two, and it's going to have a really deep root system. Um, and if you've got really difficult areas, areas that are just too shady, you can't support your lawn, it's too wet, the water gets, you know, gets too soggy. If you, you, know, you change and you match the plants to that site, you put a rain garden in, you put in nice, beautiful, shade, you know, loving um, natives, you'll have something really beautiful, easy to maintain, and it's contributing to the welfare of other species, um, supporting biodiversity and health. Uh, and just very quickly, just looking at costs. So EPA did a study looking at if you have to install convert and conventional turf sod, that would run you about twelve thousand dollars. If you do seeding, um, that's going to be a little less, four to eight thousand. If you were to do native prairie seeding, that's two to four thousand dollars. So quite a bit less. Um, and then long term, they're comparing, you know, the installation and the maintenance costs. Native plantings would cost you about a fifth of turf. Um, so P-Zone Associates, they do a lot of ecological restoration and um, manage large areas for people who um, they want to have a prairie on their private land. Um, he looked at um, the cost difference between you know, a prairie versus turf, managing turf, and large size turf and long term versus uh, a prairie, having the prairie would save you about a million dollars. He's got a spreadsheet on his website. So it's pretty amazing. So it's a, a huge, um, a huge uh, financial saver there and a lot less land, uh, intensive land management. And then in this day and age, we're a little bit more worried about water. In the US, if you have to water your acre of lawn that one inch a week that the lawn is supposed to get, that's going to be about 27,000 gallons of water on an acre of lawn. And if you think about the you know, millions of acres of lawn, and you think about what's happening in California, you think about countries that are really struggling for uh, just water for themselves to drink. We're taking potable water and we're putting on grass that we end up cutting and we're pesticiding and fertilizing it and you know, damaging our waterways. Um, it's something to kind of give you pause and to rethink what you're doing. Um, and this is a very famous um, illustration of our prairie roots. So you can see they go down, you know, 10, 12, 13 feet, getting down to where the water is. Um, and then so the, they get through, the water is able to penetrate um, further. And then every winter, about a, they lose about a third of their root system. So then that's adding organic matter to the soil, which then um, increases water holding capacity. Um, and this is the Kentucky bluegrass. So the root system doesn't go down very far at all. So, yeah, so it's pretty stunning. Um, and the other thing that's amazing here um, is that uh, fungi, mycorrhizal fungi, uh, 
creates um, a symbiosis with roots. And this is a whole new area too, it's just amazing. So the fungi hook up with the roots and they have, it's, it's a two-way street. So the fungi bring in um, nutrients like iron, um, copper, and the all-important phosphorus that remains locked up usually in soil. The fungi bring it there, bring in a nitrogen um, in the form that you know, the plants like, um, and even water too, they'll bring water. And they also will help do pest control and disease control as well, it's pretty amazing. And then um, the plants give the fungi uh, sugars carbohydrates from their photosynthesis. So they go down and they feed the fungi. They actually attract the fungi to them. Um, so that increases the root mass. Um, and it's just, it's really, the whole soil biodiversity thing is a whole other area that's just fascinating. When they lose a third of the roots, uh -huh. what happens to the carbon sequester? So because it's deep down. Yeah. Oh, sure, so there was a good question. So when the root system, so when some of the system dies, what happens to the carbon? So a lot of the, um, the respiration processes that, where the uh, decomposition is happening is happening up here, you know, with all the arthropods and the protozoa and bacteria that are decomposing and everything. If it's down here, not too much is happening because it's just not enough um, air happening. So it stays down there. Um, but it's still, it's able to absorb the water. And um, there are all kinds of soil scientists, they have videos online, you can, it's, it's amazing. So um, the more soil, the organic matter, the more water holding capacity. And then that fungi too also helps to create those little channels through the water and help to hold onto the water as well. And this is um, the original, I say, bioswale. It's uh, at the Wolf Road Prairie, so if you're ever able to go, I recommend you go. Um, I like to go and just get ideas from my garden about what plants are growing together nicely, what looks together, what looks great. Um, and so these are plants that would love, you know, having the area. This is Rattlesnake Master. It doesn't, it looks like a, like a kind of a yucca plant, and pollinators love it. Um, it's also host to an endangered um, moth uh, called the, um, rattlesnake moth, and there's some liatris here, which you've probably seen at the cut flower store. We have different kinds of liatris that are native to the area. Um, and then I think there's some uh, prairie baby's breath in there as well. And this is a yellow cone flower, which is just a delight to have in the garden as well. It's just a really beautiful plant. And that gets about three or four feet tall, and it has this drooping yellow petals, and it's just, it doesn't, it's not aggressive, um, it forms a nice clump. Um, and this is Arthur Smith, he's one of our board members, and he's been um, slowly removing his lawn. He's got the typical, you know, he had the typical kind of landscape in LaGrange, um, and he had a wet area, so he had um, Art and Linda, of Art and Linda's Wildflowers, come and put in a rain garden here. So um, he's got the pipes feeding out to it. He's got Joe Pie Weed, which is a very common um, rain garden plant to have. And this is, um, it's, a, it's a native hibiscus we have, and it's called swamp rose mallow. Uh, hummingbirds use it, and it's a host plant to the gray hair streak. It's a tiny little beautiful butterfly. Um, and then he's got, for spring, blue flag iris, which is our native iris. Um, I think he's got some kind of a mint here, and there's brown-eyed Susans, and there's some asters in here that will be blooming in the fall. So he's got color from the spring, through the summer, through the fall. So he's got resources for pollinators. Um, through the entire season, as well as just having, you know, something nice to look at, an ever-changing palette of flowers. And this is his bioswale. So we usually think of bioswales as something pretty big alongside highways. Um, and this is just in his backyard. He's got, I think it's his neighbor's um, sidewalk or a driveway. So the water comes off and it would just inundate the lawn. So he's now going to use it instead of just being mad at the water. It's killing his grass. Um, he's got a channel here and it feeds it into a dry well, um, which, um, and then it eventually trickles out. Uh, to the plants that are, you know, equipped to handle uh, periods of wetness and then periods of um, some dryness as well. And um, this is a plant that I think every rain garden should have, and even just any regular garden. This is rose milkweed. Um, it's uh, one of the favorite host plants for monarch butterflies. It gets to be about three or four feet tall, vase-shaped, um, and you will have every kind of butterfly on it, every kind of bee. Um, it's even butterflies that don't usually go to plant to flowers uh, will use that um, plant, and you will find monarch caterpillars on the underside. So look on the underside; it's kind of fun. Um, and this is a school garden. So there's uh, Joe Pie weed here in the back. Um, it's not a great picture, but this is um, uh, uh, 
uh, big blue stem, and that's our Illinois state grass. We have a state grass, if you didn't know. And so that's really, it's a nice, beautiful, clump forming tall. It's a warm season grass. Uh, and there's some of that uh, purple cone flower in the back. Um, this mountain mint, which is a really great mint. It's not aggressive. Um, again, attracts a lot of pollinators, beautiful white color, can withstand drought. Um, and then there's some, uh, some uh, New England aster in the back there, and there's some other shrubs like red, um, red stem dogwood, and we have um, uh, amorpha fruticosa. I don't, can't think of the common name right now in there as well, which is a host plant to silver spotted skippers. So these native plants, they just, they're host to so many things. So there's so much life and biodiversity in a garden. Once the more native plants that you, ha you can include, the more interesting it is. This is out at Lake Catherine. I think it's kind of an interesting um, kind of composition. So this is a, a nice plant, it's hoary vervain, and it kind of gets these sweeping uh, flower spikes, and then the back is that, um, that Monarda fistulosa, that wild bee balm is in the back there. This, it's kind of interesting, because these guys like it a little bit more um, on the dry side, um, and then the Monarda still likes it a little more moist, but it pretty, a lot of these are very adaptable too, so it's probably not super wet there. And um, this is, uh, this is a great wetland plant too. Um, it's cardinal flower, so hummingbirds love it. This is actually Pam Todd's uh, garden. She's our president, and she's got a few um, the cardinal flowers there. And she says the hummingbirds, <laughs> the hummingbirds come through. They nectar on it. They go sit on a photo on a phone line for a little while, wait for the plant to like you know refuel, and they come back down and they nectar and they chase each other around. Um, so. This, uh, I've, I'm trying to get like three or four of those guys to grow myself. And then behind it, she's got a really nice grass um, called Little Blue Stem. And that doesn't get as big. It's maybe two or three feet tall. It's got a blue cast to it, blue shade, and gets uh, really beautiful colors in the fall, a little bit of red and orange. Um, so it gives you winter interest as well. And the birds eat the seeds um, in the winter. And then again, there's the uh, coneflower, the ubiquitous coneflower. Um, she's got some um, anise hyssop there which is really great, um, a plant to have. Uh, it's, again, butterflies love it, bees love it. Goldfinches eat the seeds in the fall. And it's, again, one of those, it's in the mint family, so it's got these nice shaped, beautiful leaves. Good, um, it's got a nice scent to it as well. It's feel like a sensory garden, be a great addition. Um, this is um, one of our golden rods. You have to have golden rods. Um, they're just like one of the most ecologically important herbaceous plants that we have. Um, they support so many different kinds of insects. Um, and this one blooms really early for most goldenrods, but I think it's just such a lovely yellow color, and I love the shape of the, the rays. Uh-huh. Do you know what kind of goldenrod It's called early goldenrod. Early? Yeah, early. The Latin is a soligago. You can see it. It's J-U-N-C-E-A. Let's pronounce it. And again, the monarda. <laughs> monarda fistulosa. Um, and this is my garden one year in June, so it's almost all native. So it doesn't, you know, it's not crazy looking, it's not out of control. Um, slowly getting rid of lawn here, so I had edged this out. I did keep, this is a cat mint, you might recognize it, and I keep that because it borders a sidewalk and people are walking their dogs and it's very, um, you know, salt tolerant, so it, it takes some dog urine. Um, and you gotta think about things like that. You don't want your precious, like, you know, bottled gentian on the, on the sidewalk and then a dog comes by and pees on it. So um, I have a whole kind of little buffer zone. But um, there's that uh, rose milkweed. Um, I have the butterfly weed down here, which is our orange um, weed, and it grows pretty low. And um, although mostly monarchs use this, I have seen a female monarch prefer to lay on that. And the theory is that if that's what she ate as a caterpillar, they have a memory. If that's what she ate as a caterpillar, that's what she's gonna lay her eggs on. They taste uh, by their feet. I know, the whole, that's just amazing, the whole insect world. We don't give them enough credit. Um, and then I got purple prairie clover, it's not blooming yet. And this is another really wonderful plant to have is, um, it's a Penstemon digitalis foxglove beer tongue. And um, again, nice, beautiful, glossy leaves, beautiful white flowers, very popular with um, pollinators. And that one will go full sun, part sun, and shade. It just, in the shade, it just doesn't flower as, as much. It doesn't get such big, you know, flowers. Yes? What was the purple what? Um, purple prairie clover Thank you. is just a great, I think I've got a picture somewhere else. It's just a really nice, beautiful foliage. Um, if you've got rabbits, they might like to chew on it. Um, 
and it also hosts plant to some um, small butterflies. Yes. What's the significance of your signage and how important is that to you? Thank you. Um, so I do, I do like to do some advertising about what I'm doing. So if you're moving to a native garden, um, it's really nice to kind of share the message. Um, so I have, a, it's called, it's a Monarch Way Station. So if you get really serious and you want to, you can register your garden with uh, Monarch Watch. And they're a big organization that is, uh, you know, really tasked with studying monarchs and um, tracking their populations. And they've done a really great job at enlisting citizen scientists and getting citizens to do something for a species. So you just have to fill out a form that yes, you have so, many, so much of milkweed, you have these kinds of nectar plants, you have this from the fall, you have these kinds of gardening practices, you don't use pesticides, um, you know, you try to use mulch and um, you try to be as sustainable as you can. And then you pay a little bit of money and you get a nice sign. Um, and then this is with the, the North American Butterfly Association. So I came to native plants through butterflies. So I didn't study native plants. It was kind of like a backward process. I just started learning about butterflies that came to my yard, started raising them, started learning about the how dependent they are on their host plants, and then learning that those host plants were native plants. And then learning that a lot of butterflies are just uh, really, um, you know, going in steep decline, so maybe you want to do something. So it's registered with the, the North American Butterfly Association. So again, just stating that you have a variety of host plants. It's not just focused on monarchs, it's focused on other butterflies. And the same thing with some nectar plants and um, your sustainable landscaping practices. And then this was with the um, Pesticide Action Network, which was a few years ago, um, and that was just, it's a honey bee haven. I have nectar sources, I don't use pesticides and things like that. So these signs are kind of cheery, they help to explain people stop. I get told all the time that, oh, you're the one responsible for the monarchs. I get, I, you know, parents stopping with the children to watch the butters fly around, butterflies fly around. Um, so I get lots of comments on that. And then I, somebody down the road picked it up and now they have a monarch way station. So it does, it does help and then people go and they look at the website and see what they can do. Um, and this is in a different year. And this is, um, I've got now prairie sun drops. So these guys are blooming a little bit earlier. Um, and then prairie flocks. And I really, the prairie sun drops are just really, um, beautiful. Uh, they really brighten up and they're not like, like a gaudy yellow. They're just a really pretty lemon yellow. And then prairie flocks is just a really low growing. It gets maybe 18, you know, maybe two feet max. And the same thing with the sun drops. Um, and I bring this up because again, um, so I had the prairie sun drops and I happened to notice there was an egg on one of the leaves. So I investigated and my daughter found a caterpillar. So then she's like, you got to raise it. Um, so I didn't know really what I had, what kind of caterpillars these were. I knew it was some kind of in the sphinx moth family because of the horn at the tail. So I had to wait till it got to about this stage and then I was able to figure out it was a Nessus sphinx moth. So you may have seen little hummingbird moths. You think they're a hummingbird, but they're actually a moth and there's different kinds. So this is um, the Nessus sphinx moth. And so it ate the sun drops. And it was interesting because if you look in the literature, they only eat usually Virginia creeper or wild grape but I reared it on prairie sun drop. So kind of interesting, you know, you, you know, you're alert, you're aware, you're observant, you get to contribute to the understanding of these animals. Like it's not, you know, wasn't listed anywhere. So, but now we know it will eat, you know, sun drops. It'll, it's in the primrose family. Um, and the other neat thing is that um, these guys overwinter. So they pupate at the end of the summer and um, they usually go in about top inch of soil or under some leaf matter. Um, but this, I mimicked that. I kept it in a cage with some uh, paper towels and kept it outside so it experienced the same weather, humidity, and light conditions, because that's really critical for its timing to know when it's supposed to emerge. Um, but then we were able to release it. So it's just really good. My children are, you know, they're, they know a lot more than I ever did at their age. So, but it, she, and it was vibrating its wings to fly off and then it just took off. So it was a really great experience, like really, I can't say enough about it, um, having these things around in your yard. So this is uh, my backyard, purple cone flower. Um, I've taken that a lot because I'm trying to increase the diversity, but this is a sign like you can, if you get rid of your lawn and you can plant things in drifts, it looks pretty good. And then this is the red monarda in the back, the monarda didyma. And then I've got um, in the back, far back, I've got something called flat-topped aster. Um, and that I, I grow mostly out of nostalgia because when I was in New Hampshire, um, I raised um, a butterfly called Harris's checker spots. And this is the only plant, the only plant they can eat. And so they are, um, they are only present where that plant is. And of course, New Hampshire development, you know, people are getting rid of, you know, 
uh, the natural areas and replace it with lawn. We got rid of our lawn. We let in the wet meadow out there. It's called wet meadow. Here it'd be called like a sedge meadow, our sedge prairie. Um, and the white flat-topped aster came back, and then the butterflies came back. And so it's just, it's really, it feels very empowering that, you know, your yard can really sustain something pretty rare. Um, so uh, that was a big, it was a big, uh, that was a big lesson for me. It changed my life, basically. Um, it will do full sun and it will do part sun too. I have it growing even like I'm watching, I planted some in a pretty shady area so I want to see how they do, but it will do part sun too. Um, so a lot of them, if they do full sun, um, they'll do part sun more at the far end of the spectrum. So full sun is considered six hours plus. So part sun's about four to six. So like those guys, I'd probably want to make sure they got like five to six hours. Yeah, and then the great thing about those is they, they do so many things. They provide lots of nectar. Um, goldfinches and other birds love this. We say a lot of goldfinches because I just really love them, but um, a lot of dark-eyed juncos, um, sparrows come through, migrating sparrows, you know, white-throated sparrows, song sparrows come through, um, and they eat the seeds. And then um, there's some butterflies that will use the leaves as a host plant. Um, I think they've been extirpated from the area, but uh, the Gorgoni uh, checker spot, silvery checker spot, um, could use those, plus lots of moths as well, um, use them. So they're just a, like, a great backbone plant for the native garden. And then here is a, it's a peck skipper. Um, and I took the picture for the skipper, and then these two guys here are ambush bugs. They're about to ambush the skipper, but they're considered a beneficial insects, especially if you're growing food and things like that. You want to have these insects around because they're keeping the pests in check. Um, the skipper did make it, by the way. It flew away before the <laughs> ambush bugs got to it. This is a beautiful plant called Culver's Root. Uh, these beautiful white spikes of um, the candelabra flowers. Um, this was at the Arboretum in Rockford. I think it's called the Clem Arboretum now. Um, this was the plant where every, all the pollinators were. There's all that coneflower and coreopsis in the back. That's where uh, the bees were, the bumblebees. It was just really a buzz. And um, so I'm in a little bit in the uh, coming into the fall. So this is silky aster. It gets about two, three feet. can be a little sprawly, but if you prune it a little bit, you keep it in check. Um, and this bloomed for me like through the end of October this year. So where there's not much going on in the yard, this beautiful purple. Um, really, and that's in a part shade situation. Um, a little close up of uh, prairie phlox here. And then this is the uh, purple prairie clover. So you can see some of the foliage. Um, and that's interesting, it's in the legume family, so it's a nitrogen fixer, so it helps to improve the soil because it's pulling nitrogen in from the atmosphere and fixing it through its, um, it has, has bacterial nodes at, in its roots and that fixes the nitrogen in the soil, so um, it's a great plant. There's a white one too that you can get. Um, another interesting one, the uh, spotted horse mint, or it's in the Monarda family, Monarda punctata. Um, these little, um, they're calyxes, they turn pinkish purple as it gets older and love sandy areas and a really great pollinator plant. Um, just want to talk a little bit about a grass. This is purple love grass um, and it is just a spectacular native grass to have. Um, a lot of grasses uh, support different kinds of skippers and woodland butterflies. Um, and then that one, the seed heads turn really purple in the fall, it has that gauzy effect. It's a really nice kind of border if you have it in the front. Um, it's really pretty. And this is another kind of aster, aromatic aster. That bloomed definitely through into early November for me. Um, so it's really nice to have these nectar sources. Golden rods and asters are really important for the fall. Is there a proportion between grasses and wildflowers or native? Well, some people say like a 30% of grasses. So, um, which is probably a going, but I, I have a hard time doing that. But some people say, like, and make it like a matrix, like have the grasses here and there. Because in the prairie, they're, you know, you have the grasses, and the, so they, um, you have the grasses kind of supporting some of the plants that get kind of tall, and they might lean a little bit. So the grasses kind of help fill in the gaps. Um, so, you know, you can aim to have them here and there. I think at the um, Lurie Garden, you use grasses as a matrix. So they're dotted in between, and then there's the, the plants in, in, in the middle. And... Um, and this is one of our few annuals. It's partridge pea, and um, it has some extra nectaries on there. So the, the bees love to get in there and ants. Um, the leaves close up at night. It's just a really wonderful little plant. It's got pea-like flowers. Uh, it gets maybe you know two feet tall, so it's a really nice um, native plant. Because people think native plants are these tall, overpowering things. But we have so many that are, are small. And again, I'll just skip all this, the purple coneflower. Um, butterfly weed in the far right corner. Brown eyed Susans um, are really great to have. We have so many different kinds of brown eyed Susans. 
and we'll go through the, I think I'm getting a little bit uh, low on time. This is a beautiful, uh, one of our native shady love, uh, uh, shade lover plants. Uh, it's wild blue flax. It does best if it's got some, um, you know, a little bit of dappled uh, sun, but this is uh, a member's garden. Well, he, and he had to uh, cage it to prevent the uh, rabbits from getting it until it got big enough, but um, it's in its glory right now. It's really beautiful. And then um, this is a garden. It's got lots of columbines sprinkled through, uh, some grasses coming up, and white trilliums too. So I actually have some white trilliums in my own garden that I'm, I had one flower last year, I have two flowers this year, so I think it's starting to get a little colony. Um, and the columbine um, is nice, it'll sprinkle itself through, it'll seed through, and the hummingbirds love it. And this is, um, so I mentioned Joe Pied weed, there's one that loves the full sun, there's one that loves the shade, I think it's called spotted Joe, Joe Pied weed, uh, the Latin is Eupatorium maculatum, and this is one of our beautiful uh, tiger swallowtails. And their caterpillars eat a variety of um, trees. They usually like ash trees, but they're having to, <laughs> to move on a little bit. Um, I planted a small uh, tree called wafer ash. Um, it's supposed to be a host plant for these guys and for another one called giant swallowtails. So um, I'll hopefully I'll get some of those. And um, popular cover is, um, is uh, wild ginger and bluebells. And I think that's celandine um, in, the, in the back, celandine poppy. And really quickly, um, another shade loving. This is a goldenrod that loves some shade. We learned this from Pat Hill, who wrote uh, Design Your Midwest um, Native Garden. And it's called Blue Stem Goldenrod. So it stays pretty low, two feet max, can do the shade. So it's nice to have this beautiful yellow color in the um, fall. And this is um, one of our grasses. It's Carex springali. Um, stays really low, clump forming nice graceful kind of curves and then it picks up some nice color in the fall too like a purplish tint to it um so one thing with native plants so it's great to have native plants reduce your lawn um you know kind of start to get rid of per pesticides and fertilizers of which we apply 70 million pounds um, of those things every year in our lawns um, so once you have native plants and also trying to use some eco-friendly practices so if you can Keep your garden standing through the fall and the winter. Do very little cleanup in the spring. That We have a whole other uh, presentation on that because that helps the insects survive um, diapause, their winter diapause. Because if you, if you rake everything out, you remove it. And this is where people have a hard time with me. But if you do that, you're removing everything, all the beneficial insects. And it's, uh, it takes a lot more time for those guys to come back than it does for the pests. So it really is in your interest to keep things standing in your garden as long as possible. Um, this is a Cecropia moth that I raise, and they overwinter in their cocoon. Might be attached to a tree, but they might be down in the leaf litter. Um, a lot of our moths will do that. They'll crawl down and they get in the leaf litter. Polyphemus, Luna moss. And so, I mean, just really just absolutely stunning creatures. It's as big as my hand. Um, so you can cut down stems, but try to keep them sprinkled through the, the garden because you could have somebody on there, especially if there's still leaves. It's hard to see if there's a chrysalis there. You may have some of those bees in the stems. Um, so you can keep them, sprinkle them around, have a passive compost pile. I like to think of keeping my garden kind of a holistic system, keeping my inputs and my outputs kind of in the garden as much as possible. Sometimes I'm ripping out ground ivy or something like that and it has to go in my municipal compost, but I try to keep that things as contained as possible. And keeping tree leaves in the landscape is beneficial as well. Um, you're preserving those insects. Um, you are helping to contribute to your soil health because that breaks down and the organisms breaking down your leaves feed your, your plants and your trees and your shrubs. And this is just a quick, I didn't, I always have to see it to believe it. So I had read about keeping stems. So about 12 to 18 inches. And I'm like, all right, I'll see. And it was one of those warm days. And these little carpenter bees, they're tiny, were flying around and going into the hole. It's like, okay, I guess they were right, you know, so it's a good idea to do that. This is somebody's garden in winter, left it standing. Doesn't look so horrible. Um, you know, it's kind of interesting to look at. And then we know that, you know, the animals are in there and they're safe. Plus, when the birds come through, what are they going to eat if, you're, if everything's bare, right? So they're going to be seeds. There's going to be bugs for them to eat. Um, I always get Swainson's thrushes coming through my yard, different kinds of thrushes, because they, the, they go through the leaf litter. That's where they go. They don't go through the trees. They go in the leaf litter, um, and they're eating all the insects in there. And then just one last thing for ourselves, like not only do, does reducing your lawn, increasing your, your, um, 
your gardens, it's good for your pocketbook, it's good for the environment, it's also good for you personally. There's so many studies out there looking at um, the impact of having natural areas, gardens, interacting with, you know, um, you know, gentle wildlife, <laughs> not bringing in the snakes and things like that, but, you know, having birds and butterflies and bees around really does contribute to our mental well-being. And on our website, if you go to westcook.wildones.org, we have a page devoted to tracking all of the studies that are looking at how nature impacts us health-wise, our mental health, our physical health, our ability to concentrate, um, and just, you know, that all general uh, well-being. <coughs> and join a wildlife quarter. So this is from the Chicago Botanic Society. And they are also agreeing that forward-thinking leaders are looking for ways to knit the habitat fragments into life-sustaining corridors. So the more that you can do in your yard, you can contribute to the corridor. Make sure you let us know, and we can add you to our map, too. Put a pin on there. And then, um, so I'll leave up our information here. And just very quickly, uh, this is one of my favorite butterflies, the great spangled fritillary. Um, they eat violets, and their caterpillars overwinter very, uh, I think the first, like they go through four or five stages. The first stage, really don't eat that much, and they're at the base of their host plant, surviving the winter. So <laughs> try not to clean out the garden where your violets are. Um, and you'll have more of those beautiful um, butterflies around. So any questions? So yeah. Can you clean up? Um, the answer is <laughs> Oh, I'm sorry. So the question was, the question is, when can you clean up? And that's a great question. And my answer is try really not to. Don't do, um, it. Don't do too much. Um, because what's going to happen, and I should have some pictures, and I have put it on our Facebook. What's going to happen is that the plants will come through the leaves, as long as you don't have, don't have six inches of heavy-duty leaves like on your plants. You know, maybe an inch or two. The plants will be able to come up, and if you want to, when it, if there's a lot of rain, you can move the plants to the side and just treat it like a mulch. And then if you don't like it or the leaves are moving, just use some regular mulch on top. No one will ever know. Um, as long as you don't put, again, two, three inches of heavy mulch, you know, so that the leaves are there. And, um, you know, it's, it's just really good in so many ways. Um, I can understand cutting down the stems, and if you do that, then just keep them in the, in the yard. Um, so that way you can harbor, provide harbor refuge for the insects, and then eventually the insects go away, um, and then the lignin in the stems will be broken down only by fungi, so then you're increasing that fungi in your garden. Um, and then also, those stems will become habitat for beetles and things like that, which are also important ground predators, and I could go on about um, farmers are now beginning to make use beetle banks and they're beginning to use these insect areas because they're finding that the more that they have of this, uh, these habitats, the less pesticides they're doing and the more productive and fruitful their crops are. So we can apply those same principles in our own garden. So it's a good question. So the answer is really no. <laughs> Any other questions? Yeah. So you said you're worried about rain and uh -huh. stormwater and that kind of thing. Uh -huh. So I have been peeling off the built up what has been mulch for 10 years. Oh, wow. Uh, creating a swale, but the part of my issue is my entire yard is too high. How do I? Wait, can you dig more of a basin? Can you go so, down a little bit? Yeah, that's kind of what I've been doing uh, to create a swale to get the stormwater out so that uh -huh. my basement isn't the growth right. area for all of the. Do so you plants. have a pipe or something like a drain a gutter? I've got nothing right now. I'm oh, it, that might help a lot. That I helps. just found out. Thank you for telling me I did everything wrong last winter. But uh, <laughs> oh, I'm know. sorry. Now you can move forward. Now I'm not. I mean that. That is. I mean I used to do the same thing before I knew. I was clear cutting my garden, raking it out, and then I started raising these and learning about these butterflies. And I thought, oh my gosh, I've been raking my little friends out, you know, every year. So I've been getting rid of the very animals I've been trying to track, and then I'm not providing anything for the migrating birds. But um, yeah, so if you can like dig out or get a gutter system, and then get, um, you know, get one of those elongated mm -hmm. pipes or whatever it is to, to go out to your garden is helpful. Sometimes people hire people to do that too. <laughs> yeah. There are, I know, but it is the more you can do that. I know it's, it's hard. I've done that just kind of dig out areas. And then there's lots of really wonderful plants. There's like a button bush is beautiful to put in there. And that, um, yeah, the uh, queen of the prairie loves that kind of, it's full sun, which um, is, was on the endangered list and now it's coming off. But see, this is the other thing too, is you can plant these, some of these plants you can get that are endangered and then you're contributing to the fact that you're supporting these populations of um, these, even these plants 
that are on the decline because, again, habitat destruction. So there's lots of plants that we can grow um, in our gardens that are either threatened or they're um, on the endangered list. Yes? Are you getting most of these plants from seed and raising them from seed or like on the internet? And, or are you going to like nurseries and buying the plants alive or? Okay, great. So the question was, where can I get these plants? Because it can be hard to get them at a, at a nursery. So yes, yeah, so a lot of it um, was before, uh, so I'll just back up a little bit. So while, so a lot of um, like DuPage uh, Forest Preserves has a really great native plant sale. And that was like my first place I went for native plants. Um, also, I would go to Prairie Moon Nursery, which is an online um, uh, retailer of plants. You can get plants and seeds. Uh, there's another one called Prairie Nursery um, as well. So yeah, a lot of them I did order bare root or and a lot of them I did grow from seed. Um, and then growing native plants from seed does require a little extra work because either you can, they need to go through cold moist stratification. So um, it is pretty, it's pretty uh, economical to grow them from seed. You buy a seed packet for $2, you do the cold moist stratification and then you can have like 20 nice plants. But you do have to also have that patience because it might take them a two or three years to reach their full maturity. Because you remember what they're doing, where they're growing is in their root system, is where they're, they're really putting their energy those first couple of years. And then they reach the maturity. Yeah, so, but, um, but we've been working with a lot of uh, local, our local Good Earth Nursery. We're trying to get them to carry more native plants. And actually, um, we know because um, of Trish at uh, Midwest Ground Covers, you can do a special order and get the plants in two weeks. So, and then you're not paying for shipping and things like that. But yeah, so um, there's, there's getting to be more and more resources for native plants. And if you go to our website, we have a where to get native plants and we have a list of retailers. There's a new one, it's called Native Plants Natural Communities. Um, and you get free delivery if the order is over $60 or something like that. So yeah, it's just, it's getting to be better. It's getting to be easier. So thank you, yes. Going back to lawns, uh -huh. um, you know, our lawns in Riverside are much bigger than the lawns that you were showing us in, you know, in Oak Park. Right. So I think we can all, you know, have corners of these plants, for sure. but, you know, for a, for a lawn to change that whole um, system. Right. So, for example, you know, I, I haven't sprayed for years. I feel like there's some native grasses mm -hmm. that are coming up. It's certainly not Kentucky bluegrass, and, and some of them are annuals, and they seem to die back pretty early, uh -huh. and they and so they, it looks kind of brown. Yeah. But you know, certainly now with all the rain, everything looks fantastic. Mm -hmm. So the so the violets, you know, I'm letting yeah. those grow. Half of it's clover. I think that's you know beneficial. Right. But what else can we do for these big swaths of green um, to make it a little bit more hospitable to wildlife? So this, this is a really great question. I've got a big lawn, I wanna reduce it. So, um, you know, if you've got a big budget, you can hire somebody, right? <laughs> if you don't- You also don't want all of these tall things. It no, seems you, to me no. you want pretty short plants. Well, you can, if you've got the space like for some tall, like if you wanna have like in your back, you know, backyard some tall things. I don't wanna totally turn people off of the, the height, I mean, um, I mean, there are some that go up to 10, 12 feet tall, some of the silphiums, which you might want, um, you might not. Um, but what, what I would do, like if I had that amount of space, is I probably would plant different kinds of trees, first of all. I would plant some native trees. Um, and those can be hard to find. Um, there is a place called Possibility Place, and that's what they specialize in. And actually, we're gonna do a, a fall tree and shrub sale. Because um, it is really important, and Doug Tallamy, whom I men mentioned earlier, that's his thing. He's like, really, you know, those, those tall woody plants, having layers is critically important. Um, so if you, you know, you, you did some trees, you did some shrubs, you did, you know, you put down mulch, which is not a bad thing, put down some uh, ground cover that likes those conditions, you could put down Virginia creeper, um, and then just gradually start to enlarge you know, those sections over time um, would work, or the native grasses, na native wild geranium, uh, Jacob's Ladder, you know, there's just so many different kinds. It's just, we're so restricted often because we go to the garden center and we think that's what's possible and that's really not. So um, if you get like the Prairie Moon Nursery catalog, it will knock your socks off. <laughs> it's like so much beauty out there. Um, it's just not readily available. And that's often a cost because of perceived demand from the growers and profit margin. A lot of those things that we get at the garden center are pretty cheap to produ produce and native plants do take a little bit more time, um, you know, 
because of those root systems. But so that's where I would start. And there's so many different kinds of trees, so many amazing, like small under canopy trees, like fringe trees are gorgeous. I mentioned that wafer ash. There's just a lot that you can do out there. And then service berry, nanny berry, we have native viburnums, button bush I mentioned earlier. There's a lot um, that you can do. And then, you know, so you do that. And that will take a lot of lawn because those things, you know, get pretty big. So, and if you mulch around it, and that mulch is really good because then it's feeding the soil organisms which feeding your plants. And then the water can get through that a little bit easier than it can through lawn. There's another, yes? Villages and towns have issues of growing wild things in your front. You want to address that a little bit? Because I do know someone who, um, I don't know the city of Chicago or where she was, she had a lot of wild plants in front and they were uh, fining her for not keeping everything an inch and a half tall. And, um, right, and she had just won an award too. Yeah. I know who you're talking about. <laughs> yeah, so that is, that is a problem. And um, there is, so there's a couple of things. Um, the so the question was, um, in some places, there's these munif municipal like, um, uh, regulations against quote unquote weeds that they can't get so tall. And a lot of people just assume native plants are weeds, or it looks like it might be weedy, or they're not understanding what's happening. So um, I mean, that has come about because some people, they just stop mowing their lawn. And then so of course, quote unquote, weeds come up or it just doesn't look maintained. I mean, you saw my garden filled with natives that nobody would find me for that because it just, it looks like it's intended. So um, I, I, I haven't seen her, her garden, but I know that she won an award for it. So I don't know if it was at a particular time or if there was a particular plant that a neighbor didn't like, because that can happen too. So um, in Wild Ones, there's, uh, he was a lawyer, his name is Brett Rappaport, and he's kind of addressed this situation. So he's got lots of kind of quote unquote rules, he says. So, you know, be respectful of your neighbors. If there's a plant that they don't want in their yard, like if you have common milkweed and it's starting to spread rhizomes into their yard, you know, be thoughtful about that and, and make sure that it's not spreading there. Put it somewhere where it's not gonna impact your neighbor. Um, and then he talks about um, having edges that's very important too. Um, he talks about cues to care, that it looks like somebody's caring for it. You know, it looks like um, you don't have, okay, so maybe you have some milkweed and maybe you have something else, but then you have like lots of lambs quarters and quarter, you know, other weeds growing up and kind of taking over. So you, you, you have to kind of have a conventional look, I think, out front. Um, so I, you know, I'd have to see what the exact nature of the problem was, but I, I suspect it was maybe looking a little unkempt or somebody was having a problem with dandelions or something like that and then wrote the city. Um, but the cue to care, having boundaries, respecting the neighbors, um, humanizing it, he talks about, so like the signs are important, that you, know, you had brought up the signs are important, um, having a bench, having like a nice stone, you know, um, a birdhouse, a bird bath, makes it look like it's a cared for property and that can go a long way to winning people over to, to, um, you know, to native gardens, so. Yeah. I want to take a few oh, more questions if okay. people have them, and um, okay. I'm sure Stephanie will be able to stay a little bit after yeah. and answer questions, sure. but maybe Absolutely. a few more questions. Okay, great. Sure, yes, you. Oh, okay. Yeah, I'm wondering if you work directly with villages. Uh, and um, how successful that has been. And if, you know, if Riverside is open to something like that and if they need volunteers and maybe someone here is interested. Um, so the question was getting villages um, on board with this and doing more, is, do, did I interpret that correctly? Um, and are we working with that? So we, uh, we are planning on reaching out with Oak Park. We did start to um, come up with a list of plants for parkways. Um, so the parkways are the place between the sidewalk and the street because people are interested in converting that section to, to plants. And then it would also be beneficial to the trees that grow on the parkways because how we treat the lawn under the trees impacts them because we're affecting the soil, biodiversity, and chemistry. So if you're behind pesticides and things like that, you're, you're not allowing the fungi to grow, which is what can really help take care of the tree. So we came up with a list of uh, plants that meet their requirements that's under you know, 30 inches for that area um, and is also salt tolerant. So what we would like to do more, um, I know Evanston is doing quite a bit. Um, they, are, they have really done a lot. There's a, it's called um, Go Wild Evanston, but the city is on board and really supporting the group. They're trying to make it a, a community um, national wildlife habitat. 
So it's really, yeah, no, it's, it's really impressive what they're doing. So, um, so with Wild Ones, we're trying to really gear up our, we're still a pretty young organization too. So we are really in our third year. Um, the national is much older, but the chapter is pretty young. So we're trying to gear up and, um, you know, and then get more volunteers and do things like that. But we are starting to do, like I mentioned, the little pocket prairie gardens that we've done sprinkled here and there, just to show that how approachable and usable native plants are and they can look nice and it's easy for our maintenance. We don't really have to work too hard. You know, we just put mulch down, uh, plant pretty densely, it shades out weeds, um, you know, and then the plants pretty much feed themselves because you leave the leaf matter in the garden, it decomposes. You don't really, it's really pretty easy after that first, you know, the first year getting them through that. Yes? This is a question, but referring to her uh, question about the village and being involved. The Frederick Law Olmsted Society has a number of work days during the spring, summer, and fall. And this last Saturday, we just spent along the Long Common, uh, Turtle Park, those of you who know where that is, on Long Common. We planted a number of uh, shrubs and perennials from the uh, Midwest ground cover, including a large amount of the ginger that you showed me. Oh, awesome. That's great. I saw that you guys have been doing a lot of stuff like that. So, so we're really involved cool. in a lot. So if you want to get involved, you know, yep. come to one of our work days. <laughs> and you, they're listed on your website, right? The Olmsted Society has right. a list of their work days. And you guys did the garlic mustard polling I had seen, too. Well, what was interesting, we, we planned to do the, the garlic mustard poll in April, oh. but it was too cold. And there wasn't enough of them, so I guess we're going to have to go back. Do it again. Yeah, they just keep popping up, right? Yes. Would you ever advocate renting a sod skinner to eliminate the turf grass and <laughs> sell it off to the neighbor who loves the turf grass <laughs> and then buy natives, or would that be too abusive to the soil? Uh, so it's a good question. So would it, are we averse to getting a sod cutter to remove the lawn and then um, planting natives? or is that uh, too abusive? So that would not be how I, I mean, personally I would probably not do that, but if you had a large area, um, I, you know, that one time kind of abuse would be made up for in spades by the years of wonderful care that will come through with the native, so I wouldn't. My preferred, when I do a new bed, is to make, uh, it's called a lasagna bed or a sheet uh, composting where you put down um, cardboard, you wet it down, you layer greens and um, browns, leaves and grass. Um, top layer is mulch and I let it sit over the winter and in the spring, the earthworms and everybody has done their job and it's just it's just like a new garden. It's really, it's it's no backbreaking work, no side cutter, you know, it's just, uh, it takes a little bit of work to put the stuff down, but um, it really does make a really nice uh, garden, so. Great. Well, thank you. I had a great time talking with you all. Thank you. I wanted to uh, thank Stephanie for speaking tonight. And we can present her with a book from an author, um, Riverside author, Kathy Maloney. Oh, that's awesome. Uh, World's Fairs Gardens. Oh, I love it. Thank so, you. That's and, really thoughtful uh, and nice. Plant, it's beautiful. Which Yay. <laughs> <laughs> It'll, It'll be great. I'll love it. It's a okay. Lantana. That's great. It's an annual, and the butterflies love it. It's, it's beautiful. They're, they're, well, they are in the south. It is? Oh. I thought they were just, or they were annuals. It's a Lantana, so butterflies love them. They're an annual, so they're, they're perennial down south. But thank you. I love it. It's pretty. Great. Thank you. Thank you.